All right. How's it going, everybody? It's good to see you all here. Um, this is our uh, biweekly uh, Chaos University OSPO working group meeting. And today we have the privilege of being joined by uh, Jeff Stanton, who joins us from as a program director from the NSF POSE program, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. I dropped the <clears throat> POSE program um, link in the minutes if you want to take a closer look at that. Um, and the reason that uh, I invited Jeff kind of came from discussions that we had in prior meetings just about thinking about sustainability around um, grant funded work and um, kind of how we can think about uh, maybe helping grantees consider sustainability or how we can think about projects that have been uh, received awards, think about sustainability. Um, and this is something that, that I know Sean and I have been thinking a lot about, for example, and um, like how can funded grant projects kind of outlive the funding cycle of three years? You know, how can we get, get groups to start thinking that way? Um, so I, I would like to introduce Jeff. Jeff does join us, like I said, from NSF, um, from the NSF POSE program. Jeff is also a professor at Syracuse University um, from the iSchool. If you're not familiar with that school, I was kind of mentioning to Jonathan, it's an amazing group of people uh, that has been around for a long time and has kind of really shaped how iSchools are today. So it's great to have you here, Jeff. If you would like to make an introduction and then I'll start um, with those three questions that we have for you. Sure, um, thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for inviting me, folks. Um, I was trained as an industrial organizational psychologist and um, before I arrived at Syracuse, which is many long years ago now, I was um, in what you might think of as a regular psychology department. But of course, high schools are highly interdisciplinary and so I kind of found a home in high school because of uh, love of research methods and statistics. So I've been able through my research career to be able to be involved in a lot of different projects because of uh, that those those uh, skills and knowledge. Um, so I came to the NSF about a year ago, uh, really with limited exposure to um, the world of open source, but, uh, you know, some willingness to learn. And um, so today in our conversation, um, not speaking on behalf of the agency, not not really authorized to do that. Um, and hence my um, uh, my name in my Zoom window has <laughs> been annotated with Syracuse University. So I'm, I'm speaking as a person who's learned a few things about um, open source over the past uh, year, just because of my involvement in the program, but not not uh, making any statements on on behalf of the agency itself. Um, so I've uh, been able to clear a, a few topics to talk about with you um, beforehand with with my boss, just to avoid various kinds of conflicts and things. Um, so hopefully we'll have a free running conversation and I won't uh, over, overstep the boundaries of what I'm supposed to talk about. So go ahead, Matt. Great. Well, thanks for being here, uh, Jeff. So the first question, I'll put it in chat too, um, but could you talk a little bit about how you think about the sustainability of software that is produced from funded research? So Probably everybody here um, thinks of the immediate and kind of obvious parallel to um, open data initiatives, um, which is manifested most recently with the Nelson memo out of OSTP, which I'm sure you know everyone's heard of or read. And um, but of course, there's there's things that date well before that that have been sort of pushing. Uh, at least publicly funded science in the direction of trying to make data more open. And so I, I consider us still to be in sort of early stages of that, but at least there's that kind of agency mandate standing behind the open data initiatives. And hence, you know, pretty much every application to NSF has to have a data management plan in it. 
And I think one of the results of that has been that at, at universities, universities have had a response to that, which is to try to stand up infrastructure and expertise to help investigators uh, deal with those open data requirements. And so, you know, the, the parallel is that we're maybe in, in a, a fair bit earlier stage of uh, that same trajectory with respect to code, because the mandates uh, for, you know, preservation and sharing of code are, I don't think they're nearly as consistent or forceful, and they're certainly not across all the different funding agencies that, that exist. Um, but if we look ahead, probably in the future, there'll be more, um, an effort to, to get more consistency over uh, code preservation, code sharing, uh, availability of code for replicability and reproducibility. Um, and so there's probably benefits to trying to get ahead of that curve and, um, you know, make it possible for investigators to be able to plan ahead, um, which is probably one of the most important things you can do at this point. Um, so I'll stop there and then maybe we can explore some of that further. Yeah, questions on, on Jeff's response there or comments. Do you, uh, go ahead, John. Yeah. I, I put the comment in chat. Um, I've worked a lot with the Fear for RS folks the last three or four years. And the, the data sharing, they the came out started because there was this data sharing endeavor, the standardization endeavor for understanding it. and. From a software perspective, I think they, they they would say that they got a little off track when they tried to ex when they expected the software thing to be conceptually equivalent to the data sharing problem. Like these are these are very different problems, I guess is is my point. So I, I think the the policy wise, it's it's good to think of these as important things to to standardize and measure. But implementation wise, they've discovered them or they found them to be quite different endeavors. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, Sean. Um, the F time and effort involved in trying to maintain a code base over time so that it doesn't just turn into code rot um, is uh, probably orders of magnitude larger than um, you know making data available for public reuse. And so that alone, I, I think, does make it a, a very different endeavor. Which is not to say that it's still not worth investing in, but um, it is definitely absolutely expensive. Yeah, I just wanted to make that point. So yeah, thanks, Jeff. Fair, very fair point. Jonathan, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? No, I'm uh, muted on my headset because I'm in the other okay. room away from my computer right now. I think so. Yeah, sure. Um, others on, on Jeff on that question there, the sustainability of software. So Jeff, kind of following into the second question um, with respect to open source playing a role in that sustainability, do you, do you see this as, as being something that's important for the sustainability of our software? So if, if uh, I'll put the second question in here, but um, well, I, certainly it, it does. It, it does represent one important path towards sustainability, and and I would suggest that the other important path, which is um, you know some people do take advantage of um, in in the scientific world, um, is uh, commercialization. And so commercialization can also provide the impetus to maintain a code base, make tools available, obviously at, at, at a cost potentially. Um, and uh, certainly is, is something that programs like SBIR uh, or Partnerships for Innovation will, will try to promote. Um, so if you set that aside and, and say that, you know, not, not all pieces of scientific software would be commercializable, then, then open source stands as a very promising alternative because of the possibility of kind of opening up the problem of maintenance, development, and innovation to a larger community of, of interested uh, people. So yeah, I mean, I guess the basic answer to the question is yes. <laughs> um, do, do you see it as important? 
important to try to encourage folks to outlive their funding cycle, like the software, because typically we're on, you know, these two to three year cycles. And I think the, I think at one point I had seen Jonathan use the term professor wear in one of his, <laughs> one of his talks, <laughs> you know, um, is this something that, that we should be thinking about kind of past that three year window as an example? Um, so it sounds like a simple question on the surface, but I think it's actually pretty complicated. Um, so, so I've done a lot of projects over time and I've created a lot of code and I've posted a bunch of that code on GitHub. Um, and, you know, when I go back to my repository and I see that, you know, one person has used it, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and so obviously there's a large class of projects where uh it you know it, in effect because of the nature of the research or the niche area where that research exists that there's really no need for the the software to be sustainable over the long term it's it's utility and reuse is is fairly limited and so the complication comes of course because in many projects you don't know whether or not that's going to be true from the start because the discovery process may teach you that yes this software is not something it really needs to stick around or oh wow a lot of other people have taken an interest in this um and and of course i think that creates a, a conundrum for funded projects because you don't necessarily know from the off whether or not you need to invest in that long term sustainability and that that's where the big conundrum lies. Very fair. Good point. Um, Stephanie. You're muted. I Stephanie. can't hear you, Stephanie. Yeah. Shall be solved. I'm going to, Stephanie, I'm going to move to Jonathan and then we will get your question because Jonathan also has his hand raised. Maybe it's the same question, Stephanie, I think. Yeah. Like. Uh, so uh, I love that that insight. I'm curious if you think about sustainability outside of funding at all. So for example, in the example you just gave, maybe that person who, who creates that one-off super niche project could have at the start of the project done some, let's call it market discovery, to find a large core project that is sustained by hundreds of people already that fulfills much of the needs, the core infrastructure of this niche project, and then attempted to build sort of a satellite project around that core so that in the event that the small niche project does just kind of float off into the distance, it's not that big of a deal. The core features can be absorbed into that large core, while at the same time, in the event that that unknown niche project blows up in utility, uh, there is immediately a core system of maintainers and community managers ready to sort of help uh, steward, let's say, that small project into sustainability beyond the funding cycle. So again, that root question is, do you see sustainability as anything besides funding? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so the picture you painted, Jonathan, especially the latter piece of it um, is is ideal. And, and I think something that many investigators are not used to doing, uh, they've, they've conceived of the science and, and the questions and the theory, uh, but they haven't necessarily at the time when they're writing um, their first proposal or whatever it is that they're doing to get their project started, they haven't necessarily done that customer discovery piece that you mentioned. And um, I, I've personally had the experience of only discovering like a year later that there is something I could have used, which would have saved a whole lot of time and effort. And um, and so that that discovery process is really pretty key uh, and something that I think we need more kind of institutional motivation to um, to to uh, get that happening at the beginning of a project rather than like me a year a year late. So I, I think it's a it's a really good point for sure. Great, Stephanie. We're hoping. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Now wait. <laughs> I just uh, my other speakers overtook my uh, which I didn't realize were on overtook, overtook my audio. I was like, what? 
Um, okay. okay, great. Uh, well, first, I uh, yeah, I, I I I really like Jonathan's point. Um, but also prior, I was original comment was on an earlier comment you made about the commercialization. But I do like the point that you had about um, uh, with regards to trying to figure out whether something is worth and worth sustaining. I guess is the way to put it. Like the idea is that if this is, and I think it's kind of similar to what you also just said, which was trying to understand whether or not there's something that's may actually be better that supersedes what you're doing and being willing to understand it, like put that, that what you worked on maybe now needs to be sunsetted. And I think that's something that we're missing a lot within academia. And I like your idea of like the discovery aspect of that. So I, I really appreciate that comment. My earlier, but the question I had was from earlier when we were talking about commercialization. And I know this isn't how, how necessarily how you meant it, but um, it sounded like it was one or the other. You either do open source or you do commercialization. And I know that there are, instances where we can see sustainability happening because you're able to commercialize an open source project from academia. I mean, I have a job because of Seth and that's exactly what happened with, with that. But I was wondering what, I mean, so that's that one instance that I know of. I mean, I know a number, but that's like, of course, a key one for, for what, what we've done. Is there other, are, like, have you seen that? Or are there ways of kind of pointing more to those situations where we have an open source project that has um, been successful commercial, uh, commercializing and coming out of academia that could be maybe something that or ways of highlighting those situations a bit more than now uh, than I because I don't think that's something that's always obvious to people that are going through the process like we are. Um, so let, let me see if I can focus in on a, a piece of that that I actually know something about. Um, <laughs> um, so the uh, the the first point that you made, Stephanie, is 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 well taken, right? There's not a it's not a binary between commercialization and open source. Um, it it's not even really a binary between closed source and open source because there may be parts of a, a project which you know sort of remain behind a screen for national security purposes or something like that. Um, but on the continuum, you know, the uh, any given professor is probably likely to be thinking about one path or the other. And if there's um, a possibility of of having a, a pro project turn into an income stream, that that could potentially be be very um, a, attractive. But but on the other side, um, you know, it's clear that open source projects can spin off or be connected with revenue generation, which is a, a you know, really important path to sustainability. There are some projects which can run purely on volunteers, but I think they're you know, relatively small and tend to be relatively low impact. Um, and so pro projects which need to hang in there over a long period of time do need money. And that money comes from monetizing some valued aspect of of the you know the code or the data or both um and i think looking for that uh that uh, opportunity is is a really important part of planning ahead for sustainability right knowing that this project is going to become big enough that it will need money and therefore we need to think from the from the start about revenue models um you know, outside of the obvious things of getting more, getting more grants, right? We need to think about revenue models in order to promote sustainability over the long term. Now, I think I've only gotten part way through what you're interested in talking about. So, re refresh me on where this should go next. Oh, for what I was saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I guess the question was: Do you have uh, are suggestions or thoughts on how to make it? Uh, uh, point more towards the situ successes where we've seen uh commercialization happen in open source from that that start with with, with projects that started in in a university setting, and I, I don't think that there are. I think it's here and there, but I don't think that there is a like a centralized way of people kind of discovering that, looking at those as models. And I think that that's um that's one thing I'm more interested. Um, if there's something, if something more out there, like I, like I said, I know my my case uh, very well. But um, do how many others are out there that we can start pointing people to? Because everyone's like, oh yeah, Seth is like an 
and maybe it's a unicorn maybe that's just you know that's the only like one of the few but I don't think that's true I just don't think it I think there's so many different ones but they're also all, a whole different a whole bunch of different sectors I mean I'm thinking of some of my um my colleagues that are working on different projects in open source and asking me that question like so how do we do this in a way that's like we can do both you know to keep it open source and also make it commercially viable or viable in a way so yeah so you you want a directory where we can dial up a web page um you know do a keyword search and be able to show projects that have successfully made it into some form of perpetual or it's not a, i don't know if a directory is right but or just something where is there is there an insta or ways of highlighting it better than, or and especially i think i feel like with, especially with um the amount of uh, support people are putting uh, like the NSF and other agencies are putting into it. It'd be great to have. I mean, it'd just be useful to actually see see that. I think it would. Inst there'd be a, a definite be benefit. So I just, I'm, I'm not saying you guys have to do that. I was kind of like, do you know of any situ? Or a, are you? What are your thoughts on how that to structure something like that? That would. What is it? The conference that we have where we highlight this, or is it something more like a you know, or like yeah, some sort of. A journal that focuses on that something that we can point people to to find those case studies i think it'd be easier because i do feel like a lot of times people feel like they're starting from scratch which what they're not i mean they're just reinventing the wheel but they don't realize the wheel is there so it's like how do you point people to the right to the right uh, model for them for what they're doing yeah yeah and um you know my idea of a directory is is you know a, a little bit silly to start with, but but meant to kind of illustrate that that same point. But if, if you think of the analog and data, um, you know, you may or may not like it, but Google data search is, you know, it's pretty cool to, uh, as a place to start for this kind of thing. And I, I don't know of any analog. I mean, you can search for keywords across GitHub, but um, I don't really know of a good analog uh, for finding projects that meet a certain you know, set of set of criteria beyond keyword searching, but I will um, just mention um, I, I had an intern this summer, and I had her work with public data um, that NSF publishes. You're all familiar with it. It's the award search database, so you can get you know basic information about expired and current awards out of it, um, and anybody can do it. But what I asked her to do was to take um, projects that NSF had funded in the past um, that that you know had an open source component to them and use some code to try to track down whether those projects were currently active. In other words, had somebody what was first of all, was there a repository that represented the project? And second of all, was the repository fresh, right? Did it have a, a fairly recent uh, date? Um, so uh, what do you think? Did, was that a, a a good thing to do? You think it yielded some interesting results, or was kind of easy to get done? Or I would like to know the results. I would like <laughs> to know the results. I'm like, I don't, I don't know how good it was, but it sounds like a great idea. Yes, yeah, so it was <laughs> I a great Jonathan idea. Really interested in it. It was, I thought, a great idea at the beginning of the summer, and it turned out to have so many pitfalls and to be so difficult, and um. You know, so it was, if, if you looked at it, just looked at it in terms of accuracy, like, okay, on this side, here's a public record of an NSF award. And on this side, there's the actual repository of code that belongs to that. And we're going to draw a line between those. So that, you know, it, as a measure of accuracy, that whatever we did, all the different techniques we tried, everything I knew how to do in terms of text analytics and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, really never got the accuracy to any kind of a reasonable level. It's a really hard problem. And so setting all that aside, what it showed to me is that we don't know, for thousands and thousands of projects, we don't know what happened to them after the award period. We don't know. Um, and apparently nobody knows, and there's really no uh, great mechanism for for finding out either. So the thing that you conceptually were asking about, Stephanie, I think it's fantastic. A, a conference might be a great place to start to explore you know, how to do it, um, but I don't know that it exists, and, but it would sure be cool to have for sure. Great. And I think Jonathan has an interesting point about Jonathan, it. <laughs> it sounds, I'm guessing you have a response. Unfortunately, only questions. 
Uh, so <laughs> it it sounds like there's limited tracking of impact and continuation uh, for projects once they get funded. Is that a accurate assumption for a lot of these grants? Um, so it's uh, I, so so I would say for a standard a small standard research grant, um, which I know you know many many of you have experience with, uh, you have um, a, a small set of reporting obligations, or sometimes they don't seem small when you have to be the person doing it, but it's a small set of of obligations. It's annual reports, a final report, and a, and a final public impact report. Um, and so every PI who finishes an award is obligated to provide those last two things. Um, and, and after that, there is no obligation, to my knowledge. Um, and that would be something that pertains to, to a, you know, a standard research grant. Um, now, but there is a whole separate world of um, you know, large installations and, you know, um, large scale initiatives that has a much, much deeper well of evaluation associated with it on an ongoing basis, including, and I, I'm not speaking from um, firsthand knowledge, but I'm guessing that some of those larger projects do have, you know, specific um, leg legislated reports that they have to produce that, you know, are publicly available and are probably inspected by members of Congress. So there are uh, different worlds there, um, but but see your assertion, Jonathan, um, about a kind of a smaller standard research grant is, is probably close to correct. So a follow-up then, I guess, uh, Okay, so we just came from a SDG group at Chaos Hosts, which was fantastic. We're trying to figure out how to put metrics into, among other things, put metrics in a file that folks can upload to the repo uh, to claim that they are you know, contributing to one SDG sustainable development goal or another. Uh, and there's a bunch of other files like this, contributors that markdown, uh, uh, citation.cff, funding.json, are any of it, it seems like these types of files are great for machine readability in terms of tracking continuation of use and impact and things like that. Uh, are, I guess just what are your thoughts about including making those requirements to any research grant? Like, hey, if you make software, here are the standardized files that we expect to be in any repo you create so that we can continue to just scrape some data from it over the course of a couple of decades uh, to track its usage and sustainability. Yeah, I mean, that that I think directly addresses uh, Stephanie's previous question. Um, you know, that's something that really could enhance discoverability over a longer term. Um, and then the question of requiring it, uh, you know, with again, pointing back to the to the Nelson memo, it's it's um, takes I think some time for there to be a kind of upswell of 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 um, you know motivation for having that kind of thing be required, and we're I don't think we're there yet. But everything that you described, I think, is absolutely a step in the right direction. Open to any ideas on how to make us get to that point, because I would love it. If everyone had those files, but thank you, thank you for the thoughts. Well, so I mean, it, the the leverage is is with the you know the governing elements that um, you know have have influence, uh, you know, over over agencies. So National Science Board, as an example. Um, and so involvement in some of those larger scale organizations is is where those conversations are probably already started. But but, you know, obviously, that's the place where you push them along. I apologize. That made me think of another question. If that's all right. Uh, we had. Is it related? Yes. Okay, okay, just, I think hang, very brief. Hang, hang tight. OK. Uh, yeah. So. 
is there a place for people who have been in open source for decades and have a bunch of these ideas? Like I'm just parroting people who are much smarter than me in terms of getting these files and whatnot in there. Is there open calls from these governing bodies about, hey, how can we fix this problem in the next round of grants that we send out? What should we include in there? Uh, so we can widen who's involved in that conversation. I'm not aware of any offhand, but that's probably more ignorance than than anything else, Jonathan. Um, it's it's a it's a good question, but it would require some research to really dig into it. But I'm not aware of any offhand. Okay, thanks, and sorry everyone else for taking so much time. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, David. Good, 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 good questions, Jonathan. Um, I'm sort of piggybacking on this, um, and I'm probably going to show off my ignorance for grant writing. But um, you talked earlier about the um, data management plans. Is that a place where um, you could give more guidance on to the grant submitters um, and maybe say, you need to have these files. You need to include a software management plan um, as part of your data management plan, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm I'm getting pretty old at this point, and so I've I've been you know tr trying to get grants over a, a pretty long period of time, and I I can remember back to when some of these things were introduced, David, like the data management plan when that was first introduced, um, and so there's is you know a, a f gradual but steady sort of evolution in what the expectations are. Um, for what you have to provide in order to have a viable uh, proposal. And I you know, I think you're you're right on the money. There has to be some element in the future, uh, you know, if we want to enhance the things that Jonathan talked about and Stephanie, uh, there has to be an element in the future where people can um, you know, tell what their plans are and give evidence that they've thought about it and, you know, say what they're going to do about sustainability. Um, so whether that is the, the data management plan is the right place for that or some other new element, I, I, I don't know. That's way above my pay grade. Thanks. Yeah, Megan. I never know where the raise hand button is. It's okay. Um, I, saw you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, um, NASA has incorporated, um, software management plan into their, so they're calling it now open science and data management plan. Like mm -hmm. if you want to apply for a NASA roses grant. So David, that might just be something to peek at. Um, it's not as well fleshed out. I don't think as the data management part of it, but they, they do now, like, I think at the next cycle of NASA roses grants, they are requiring a software management plan, which doesn't talk a lot about sustainability. It's more that kind of pre-work, you know, Jeffrey, as, as you mentioned, you don't know where it's going to go, but it's this statement of intent that, you know, you, you intend to do this thing and here's where you're going to put it and here's what your thoughts are on it. But, but it's a, it's pre-work. So um, it's, it's yeah, not really but, but it's a fantastic first step. I, yeah. I think yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. It's great. Um, so yeah, more of that, please. <laughs> That's interesting. I hadn't heard about that. Thanks for sharing that, Megan. I didn't know that. Um, other questions right now? We're approaching the last question. So, um, so Je Jeff, there's a lot of people on this call who are at university open source program offices, meaning most everybody that's on this call. <laughs> so this last question is, you know, are there things that, that folks could be doing at their universities to help their fund or help funders think about um, help funders in, in improving sustainability of software stemming from funded research. So if you think about it kind of in a classic open source sense, you know, the university OSPOs are in a sense, the upstream working with people who have um, an interest in writing grants and thinking about how to structure those grants. And then ultimately they, they make their way into a submission process and a review process and potential funding. So, you know, are there things that, that you can think of that, would kind of help in that upstream in these OSPOs that would help applicants think about sustainability of software and, and signal that as well. So um, one of the things that uh, is kind of cool about um, iSchools is maybe half of them or maybe more than half uh, um, started as library schools. And so there's kind of a natural built-in connection to librarians and librarianship. 
and and I remember some of the earliest conversations about um, uh, you know data data management, making data open, and those were conversations that were facilitated between professors and the library and professional librarians, um, and that was you know that that was. Uh, really a positive thing in many ways because librarians, at least ones that I've spoken with, sort of ran with the ball, right? And and really helped to move things forward and help to evaluate and establish um, internal repositories uh, for data and so forth. So I think there are personnel resources at most universities that are kind of natural collaborators. And it may be that librarians are great for you know code sustainability as well but the other source i think that is underappreciated is um, folks in university it and in university it they wrestle every day with open source in kind of non-obvious ways right there are so many stacks that are used in production software to keep the university running um, that contain open source that, you know, it's it's really something that you have to be considering, especially from a security perspective all the time. And so I think there's a natural synergy there that probably isn't well leveraged uh, at many places, which is to tr try to extend that umbrella of really understanding and knowing about open source um, in the area of production IT um, over the research enterprise. Um, so that that kind of a collaboration, you know, just starts with a conversation like, what are you guys doing about open source? Who who is it that you know watches the supply chain and knows whether or not there are security vulnerabilities? And so there, those sort of touch points, um, I think, could lead to that wisdom being sort of diffused you know, into the research community a little bit more than it is. So that's one possibility. And then the other possibility is that, you know, uh, some some universities, I think, have been leaders in trying to create policies university wide that encourage uh, PIs to, you know, do various things associated with their research projects. Um, you know, one obvious one is the IRB, but um, you know, data data management is another one that that is you know subject to policy. And policies are interesting because they um, obviously you know people complain about them, but they do sort of create mo motivation and forward momentum in something. And they also tend to help develop expertise. Right in response to policy changes, people learn how to do something, and that learning is then diffused throughout the organization. So policies of can be kind of a powerful lever. Um, and if, if there's a policy about expectations for code that's created as part of research, hey, it gets people thinking about that earlier in, in the process, which I think is kind of powerful. Yeah, and Sean comments about, you know, IT being understaffed and focusing on security. I to totally understand that. Uh, but even even in that, though, there there may be, you know, some some people who are sympathetic to what's going on in the bigger picture. Well, I, I have a meeting with my CIO in a couple of weeks, so I will bring this up on the campus IT rabble rouser. <laughs> good, good for you. Yeah, <laughs> that's an important role. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to just follow up on that last comment, particularly around policy, Jeff. So here in the chaos project, one of the things we do is we obviously work in the creation of metrics that can help kind of understand things about open source work. And I'm wondering about say policy that would encourage PIs to kind of bring forward metrics that might be used to indicate um, things like growth of community or things like long-term sustainability, kind of standardizing that language as well. Not just to think about um, like license selection or um, vulnerability management, but to also think about things that are community oriented as well. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a powerful goal. Um, I, and I can certainly anticipate a fair bit of resistance associated with it. I don't know if that's been your experience. We haven't tried well unless other people have tried so 
so I can't speak to the resistance <laughs> coming <laughs> <quite> yet. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, so I, I again, it it it's exactly it's what's needed, but I I would I would probably advocate for baby steps towards it rather than a a, a great leap. There may be smaller things to try to achieve first that would help to lead in that direction eventually, but um, and maybe fa face less resistance. Fair, <clears throat> fair point. Uh, other comments for Jeff? Yeah, David. Um, how do I phrase this? I'm curious, based on that last the last question, how could universities help funders? Um, if there's any specifics with respect to POSE, where the OSPOs, you know, there's some like really promising open source ecosystems that you're excited um, to, you know, push out into the community. Um, if, if we could help, if, if, if there's a idea for translation for that type of thing. Or uh, can, you, can you just say a little bit more, David? I'm, I, I got the part about POSE, but I didn't get exactly what you were um, digging at. Um, I'm trying to wonder if there's some translation process where the OSPOs could help um, take a project, a research project, and implement it to a broader ah, okay. so, success story. So uh, there's one concrete thing that I, I don't know if anyone's read the newly released solicitation, um, but upon suggestion of, of a person here, uh, I... Um, uh, was able to get language included on eligibility to include um, um, OSPO staff uh, as eligible PIs. And so that's, I think, food for thought there because um, depending upon the role that the OSPO takes within the university and the way that's structured, um, it could be a, a great boon for long-term sustainability to have someone you know, knowledgeable and experienced uh, leading a project like that. So it's a it's kind of a natural fit with the sustaining sustainability goal to have an OSPO leader um, running something uh, that wants to go over a long period of time. Good, thanks, Jeff. So Stephanie, I see your hand up. We have about four minutes. Just oh, I just wanted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll just be really quick. I just want to say I really appreciated that extra thing that got added. Also, not just for the practicality of being able to be be a PI, but also I was able to like say it to my office of research, like, "Hey, we exist according to it." <laughs> it was very. It was actually I hadn't even thought about it when I first read it, but then just being able to point out, and I think that 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 in and of itself, I just wanted to throw that out to the group and to, to to thank NSF for thinking and, and Jeff for you for thinking that through doing that because I think it actually added a lot of ability for OSPOs to kind of now point to a document and say we have a reason we are we are an acknowledged uh, entity now um, even at, 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 within the U.S. government like we they acknowledge that that academic OSPOs exist and I think that was actually I think even beyond just the practicalities of allowing people to be PIs that that that's a huge step too. So you're saying it's a kind of signaling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is. I don't think that was what I thought, of, like thought that through um, when discussions were having about it, but it was like, oh, that made a huge, that was really, really helpful. So, and if you hadn't thought it, I mean, you probably, I'm, I'm assuming that NSF was seeing that as well, but it was really appreciated. The the other audience in that same respect that may, may see the signal is um, universities that don't yet have an OSPO. Very fair. All right. Um, we're coming to the end. Jeff, do you have any last thoughts or anything that is kind of going through your mind based on this conversation? Um, not, not really. My brain is sort of like watery now, but um, I, I would uh, commend folks to also take a look at the newly released um, Safe OSE. Uh, solicitation because it's a it's about security, but it, it, in a sense, what it, it is targeting is to make an impactful project uh, be able to survive over a long period of time without messing people up. Um, and of course, that that is a key goal of security, but also a key goal of sustainability. So um, it does, I think, have some relevance to what we talked about today. Awesome. I know well, I saw it and then looking at it. So thanks, Jeff. 
and for everybody who's pulled it up right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, can't thank you enough for taking your time and uh, thanks for everybody for being here and asking just an amazing set of questions. I really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon, everybody, and take care. Right. Bye. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Hey, bye. -bye. Thank you. Hey, bye.